I don't think there's that silver bullet yet where people are waking up and going to, you know, whatever, Tesla, I'll just pick on them because we're talking about it and like, oh, I want sure. solar, I'm going to go to Tesla and sign up because that's not happening at scale. It will eventually, but not right now. Hello and welcome to the Solar Maverick podcast, where solar meets entrepreneurship and experience. I'm your host, Benoit Thanjan, so let's get into it. Hi, this is Benoit, your host of the Solar Maverick podcast. It's our hundredth episode of the podcast. I'm really excited about that. I wanted to thank our listeners who we call Solar Mavericks for listening to the podcast and being very supportive. I appreciate your time listening and all the people who reach out to provide feedback. I would not have gone to a hundred episodes without you and I look forward to another hundred more. This podcast wouldn't happen without a team of people, and I would like to thank them as well. I would like to thank Kevin Y. Brown, who's the producer of the podcast and helped start the podcast. His team at Podcast Laundry does an amazing job editing the podcast. Also, I would like to thank Lee Wang, who's the marketing director of the podcast, and my company, Renew Energy, who came up with the idea of having the podcast from hearing me being interviewed on Kevin Y. Brown's podcast. And he's also co-hosted several episodes and came up with the name, as well as Suzanne Waters, who's co-hosted several episodes of the podcast. Podcast as well. And I would also like to thank our guest on the show as well. You know, this is an interview style format for most of the episodes, and they provide an amazing insight into the industry. And it's interesting as well because we've had some listeners become guests as well. For the 100th episode, I interviewed Nathan Giovanelli from IJS Solar, and it was an amazing interview. He's been a regular contributor to the podcast and was on three previous episodes. I could not imagine not having him on the 100th. If you're interested in listening to Nate's other interviews on the podcast, they're going to be in the notes of the podcast. He's a thought leader, entrepreneur, friend, and colleague. He's the director of business development at IJS Solar. He helped form IJS Solar in 2000. 2014. IGS Solar is a sister company to IGS Energy, which is the largest privately held energy supplier in the United States with more than 4 million customers after developing more than 30 megawatts of solar for nonprofits and Fortune 500 companies. He moved on to start the residential solar division at IGS in 2016. IGS now has a thriving residential business where they partner with turnkey energy procurement and construction EPC companies that use their third-party ownership model to allow more than a thousand new residential customers make the switch to solar every month. He currently leads the development of the residential solar business along with other national and strategic partnerships for IGS Solar. Just to give you an idea, like IGS's solar assets are valued at $230 million. They have projects in 19 states and developed over 112 megawatts since 2014, which is pretty amazing in a very short time period. Nate talks about a lot of interesting topics on the podcast. Some of them are are how customer acquisition is a major expense for residential solar and how it could be lower. Also, how solar policy should incentivize distributed solar, trends that he's seeing with storage and electric vehicles. And as I usually say in the beginning of the podcast, let's get into it. Hi, this is Benoit, your host of the Solar Maverick podcast. I'm excited to interview Nathan Giovanelli. He's the director of business development at IGS Solar. And Nate's actually, this is your fourth episode on the podcast. So I appreciate you being a major contributor. And I'm excited to have Nate on for the 100th episode of the Solar Maverick podcast. Welcome to the show, Nate. Thanks so much. As always, it's an honor to be here. I feel a real privilege to be on the 100th episode. This is really cool. So I appreciate that. Yeah. And one of the exciting things is we're actually, this is our first in-person interview in more than a year. And I appreciate Nate making time out of his busy schedule for us to meet. And I always like in-person interviews better because I feel like it's a lot more better discussion than if you do it through Zoom. I agree. The first two were in person. We did the third on Zoom. And when Benoit asked me to be on, that was kind of what I was saying, especially for the 100th episode. Episode, I said, we got to bring it. So we got to be there in person. I got to feed off that energy. <laughs> and we're live. This will come out live, but we're in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So this has been great. And, you know, we'll get right into it as we say in the podcast. If you haven't listened to the previous episodes, I think it would be helpful for the audience to get an idea of IGS Solar and what you guys focus on and, and specifically like your role at the company. 
Sure. Yeah. So IGS Energy is our sister company. It's the largest independent energy supplier. So we're family owned and operated over 30 years in business, 2 million customers, and we supply our retailer of energy. So if you live in a deregulated market, you can buy a whole suite of products, but mainly gas and electric commodity from IGS. And not only are we the largest, I think we're one of the largest residential suppliers as well in terms of customer equivalents, but we're also the first to announce that all new customers will get 100% green energy. So whether it's green power, we're offsetting with a renewable energy credit or a carbon neutral gas. I believe we were the first company to publicly make that switch. That's awesome. That's huge. And I know before, like that pricing wouldn't usually be at a premium. So that's great that, you know, IGES is adding a lot of value. And is it IGES like the fourth largest third party energy supplier or it's hard to keep track because sure. it it's like all stats, I think. <laughs> yes. And this is a little bit out of my realm of expertise on the commodity side, but it's whether you look at basically residential equivalents mm -hmm. or if you're looking at total supply, there's a couple of different metrics oh, okay, to look at. Sense. We're definitely the largest privately held. I believe we're the largest residential supplier. But when you look in totality, you know, there's some huge energy users that maybe IGS doesn't service as many of as some of the national players. So it can't answer that specifically, but I I believe it, we're in the top five. Definitely, which is pretty amazing. And the company continues to keep growing in a very family-oriented environment. Yeah, and they're very green conscious, especially for an energy company. We have the goal out there to be carbon neutral by 2040, I believe it is. And I'd like to think that the solar division's playing a part in that. So I came over a little over seven years ago to start distributed generation business. At that time, it was combined heat and power, which is interesting for sure. For sure. Especially being a gas commodity supplier. But I think we were doing that for a few months. And we're like, hey, this is interesting. It's kind of the bridge to really renewable or clean power, which would be solar. So we pivoted pretty quickly, got into commercial solar. There was a group of us that started that division, which is still thriving. I don't know the exact amount of megawatts we've deployed. I know I did about 30 probably in that before I then started the residential solar division, which in the last four years, we've deployed roughly half a billion dollars worth of capital in the space. So we're what you would call third-party owner or TPO product. So somebody can go solar with no upfront cost. We own the array. We monetize the federal tax credits or any other state incentive and basically become the utility on their roof. So when you see these ads or whatever, depending on where you're at, solar for no money down, that's generally a TPO product, which is what we would do, which again is called a power purchase agreement. And if you're buying power, say in New Jersey for 18 cents from your utility, including transmission and distribution and support supply, but you could buy solar for 13 cents. You don't have to pay for the solar. Someone else owns it and you're just buying the kilowatt hours that are being produced on the roof. So that's what we do. Like I said, we're going to be the long-term asset manager and owner of these projects, deployed 500 billion again in capital. That's around 132-ish megawatts and we're growing rapidly. Wow, so yeah, we'll do a lot there too. I like to look at the carbon offsets, especially because we just talked about energy company and being green mm. and I actually wrote this down. I think I posted on LinkedIn about it not that long ago, but just last year, the customers that were the owner and asset manager of their solar just for residential, not including our commercial solar division, was enough carbon offset of 317 million miles driven, which is like to the moon and back 663 times. Or you could look at it as 140 million pounds of coal burned annually that we saved. Or conversely, another way you could look at it is the same amount of carbon being sequestered as 155,000 acres of forest. So when customers ask, like, how can I make an impact? It doesn't take much. I mean, my family and I are always looking for ways that we can minimize our carbon footprint. We have solar on our home. And I think that it's something you're going to continue to see more and more of into the future. I totally agree with you. And that's amazing, like the work that you and the IGS team have done in a very short period of time. I might add as well, right? Because you basically started the IGES distributed generation platform and what that was six or seven years ago. Yeah. And then to pivot to solar. And then as well, I think for commercial industrial, based on a 2017 stat, I think you guys were the fifth biggest developer of commercial industrial we projects. Were, yeah. And we still are. So we do a fair amount. I'm not as close to that division anymore. I used to play in both and 
I don't know exact timing, but probably about a year ago, I switched over to residential solar pretty much full time. I still dabble. I still have some customers in commercial solar that I service or have questions. And there's some large Fortune 500 companies I've been working on for years that I still talk to regularly just to kind of be a resource for them if they're thinking about going solar. So I play a little bit in that space. And as you know, we talked about at lunch, it's really all about being opportunistic and trying to, instead of managing your calendar, manage your priorities, which I actually read that from the other day from someone on LinkedIn is really insightful, I think. But that's something that we both agree that we're really good at when you're trying to juggle a million different things. It's really what are your priorities and managing them instead of trying to manage every second of the day. I definitely agree with you. It's interesting with priorities because like what I do is the top three priorities of what I have to get done today. Those are the things that I focus and everything else goes on the wayside. And it's interesting because things just get done that's supposed to get done and the most important thing. So that's interesting that you mentioned that. I think a good way to really kick off this conversation (laughs) would be to talk about something that's happening in the Commonwealth, which we are, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Again, apparently this is The Rock went to high school here. It's a claim to fame. Dwayne Johnson. It's about halfway. I learned this today from Nate. (laughs) Yeah, it's halfway in between us. So we decided to compromise and meet here. And it's actually a great meeting space. But since we're in the Commonwealth, as I mentioned, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn and I like to see what other people are doing. And it's a good source of professional information and contacts. And I just, of all the social media platforms, it's the only one I really use and really enjoy. Actually, if you are open to the right opportunities, you can get a lot of business there or just meet people and you never know what it turns into. But one of my, I guess, more provocative posts... was back at the end of March and the governor of Pennsylvania announced a 191 megawatt project, which is, I guess, trying to put that in a scale for somebody. It's, I'm guessing it's equivalent power to power 25,000 homes. That's a guess. So whoever's Googling it right now, <laughs> I think that's pretty close. I could do the math, but my phone is actually recording us. So <laughs> I can't put it in my phone quick to check it. But I think that's about right. In any rate, Pennsylvania announced this project that was going to supply 50% of the energy to the Commonwealth. I don't mean like all the residents and businesses, but literally what the Commonwealth consumes. And there are a few interesting things about it, but kind of what struck me was the governor called it innovative. And he also said that this is the kind of projects that Pennsylvania needs moving forward, as opposed to the alternative energy portfolio standard or the AEPS, as they would refer to in the industry, which basically requires suppliers or load serving entities to purchase a certain amount of these recs. Just like I said earlier, how IGS supplies green energy and how we do that, we buy an equivalent rec for every unit of power to offset what the customer is consuming. And that's what, quote, makes it green. So as that sun sets, I think that it's going to cause problems with some of the other solar industries, if you want to segment it into different categories. But I was kind of curious what your thought on something like this is, if you think, for lack of a better term, that it's innovative. And what do you think the right mix for solar is, right? So just to put a little bit finer point on that, there's, we'll say, utility scale or grid connect. There's community, there's commercial, and there's residential. And I'm curious what your take would be as an expert in this area. You know, how does a state know when they hit the right energy mix for renewables and solar specifically? I mean, I think that's a challenging question, right? Because there's so many different facets to it. I think the interesting thing about the project that you're talking about, it's really like all utility scale solar. I think, you know, that's probably not like an equitable distribution between the other sort of not asset classes, but the type of installations. I think when I read the article and you posted on LinkedIn, what surprised me at first was like, I never really heard about this. And then it came out of the blue, like through this sort of press release, because I did Google a little bit more other articles and it was very similar to what you said. The other thing too, is like, if you're doing something through the state, like there usually is like a mandatory RFP process. And I'm surprised that only one basically developer has one, it's 191 megawatts, right? Mm -hmm. The whole RFP, which doesn't make sense to me because I believe like it should be an equitable process. You should also have it in a way that you're encouraging local developers specifically in Pennsylvania, to have an opportunity to win that business as well. Because I think you mentioned to me it was foreign company that was able to do that. So part of me is like, I don't understand like the solicitation process. And I think it should be like a fair distribution. But then it should be like an equal distribution of residential utility. I don't know, like community solar too, basically is kind of residential 
and commercial industrial in certain senses. But it's obviously better to have it, I believe, on like commercial industrial rooftops, carported systems, ground mounts, same thing with houses on roofs than like utility scale if you're using farmland, unless it's kind of like a mixed use of farmland. I think that the challenges that we're seeing is that a lot of farmlands getting used up for solar because like the lease rates they could get are higher. There's also like a land preservation aspect to it. And then like, I think the best economically is obviously you're creating jobs for people within Pennsylvania downstream, but then also to help like these businesses and residents by, you know, doing what you were talking about, TPO, you know, power purchase agreement or whether they're going to own the system. So I don't know if there's like an ideal like mix I've talked a lot about different points and what are your thoughts? Yeah, I know. I mean, I mostly posted just to be provocative. I do understand that there's other things that the state's trying to accomplish. We're a net energy exporter. I say we're because I live in the Commonwealth. So I understand that aspect of it. And I believe it's the state's not going to own it. I think it's owned by a foreign entity. But either way, all that aside, I think what we should be moving from, just my opinion, is centralized. Oh, yeah. I think we should move to distributed generation. And as you said, instead of taking up farmland, it makes more sense to put it on somebody's roof. That's not taking up usable space, right? And there's a lot of advantages of that. And what the state is creating to me by doing this and saying, hey, we're going to do this massive project at scale that residents, small businesses, and anyone who wants to control their energy future, anyone in that position can't do this same type of structure without the AEPS, right? So even if they took out a loan and owned it themselves, which again, the state's not owning it, but if a customer took out a loan and owned it themselves, now they're going to be disadvantaged because they're not getting as much for these renewable energy credits that are created because there's no demand for them if you just let the AEPS sunset at the end of this month, which is the current plan. I want to be clear, like, I don't think this is any kind of renewables I'm in favor of. But when you look at the grid and you have increasing transmission and distribution costs, right, getting the power. So having a centralized grid is not fixing that. So no matter how cheap you get the power or how inexpensive you drive power costs down to, if we're not taking care of the distribution network, prices are going to continue to rise. And again, that's why I think there's a lot of advantages to on-site distributed generation. I think the other aspect that you touched on is jobs. And another post recently that I did was from the National Solar Job Census, literally just came out, I think, a week ago. So I wanted to give them credit for that. And I was just looking at the amount of jobs that are in different sectors of solar. And it's overwhelmingly most solar jobs, when you define solar as anyone who's active in industry for more than 50% of the time, are installation. And when you break that down even further, so that 67% of the 231-ish thousand jobs in 2020, solar jobs, 67% of those are installation. And then 55% of those are residential solar installation. Wow. So when I think of it like that, I think about how could we create local jobs that are high paying? That's another interesting stat that came out. They said that solar workers are paid either the same or more for a similar worker in the U.S. And as we talked about, there's a drastic shortage of jobs right now. And when you look at these figures, just how I interpret them is that if you really want a long-term sustainable economy and you want to stimulate these local economies, that it's the residential solar and it's those jobs that are on the ground that are local. You can't travel super far for that. It's not efficient. That are going to spur that local economy. So for those reasons, that's, I guess, my kind of soapbox on it. I don't want to be perceived as it's a bad thing, but I do think, in my opinion, it gets a little hairy when you say that we're going to do this huge project here and everyone should repeat it knowing that how you get that scale as a homeowner and you don't have the same opportunities And where I think... And they specifically said by letting this AEPS sunset, when I would argue actually the reverse is true. I will say, though, that the state is at least retiring the RECs, so they're not going to, the renewable energy credits, sorry, I get it, not talking acronyms, but they're going to retire the renewable energy credits. So at least they're not going to bring the price of those credits down in the market by flooding the market. So I think obviously that was smart. And there's certainly a lot of positive things about this project. But overall, when you're looking at the number of jobs in residential solar, in well-paying jobs, diversity, 
There's been an uptick in diversity in solar. So again, I just think the whole ecosystem, right, the whole industry is on the right side, I think, of where, in my opinion, we need to go as a country towards energy independence and, again, a distributed generation and all these other things. Because when you look at what happened in Texas, for instance, it's largely a part of just how their grid operates. It has really little to do with renewables. I know they're blasted in the news, but it was mostly gas. And the more distributed you are, I think the less mass outages you're going to have. Yeah, definitely. I agree. I mean, I think the whole point that you mentioned about centralized power versus, you know, distributed is a huge thing and that the grid will be more resilient with distributed versus centralized. But at the same time, too, the grid does need upgrades once you start incorporating different technologies like storage and obviously solar. You know, the reliability is a huge thing. It's interesting because you were really talking about downstream, basically jobs created the downstream, specifically the solar installer. The cheaper that solar is to install, the potentially the more downstream opportunities there are, which is interesting because you talk about a large utility scale project. It's different. Yeah. But it's 191 watts, megawatts, I apologize, versus like you're doing it for one home. But the other interesting thing that comes up as well is like, should there be tariffs on raw materials, on solar modules? Because like, in a sense, the tariff is making these projects more expensive, which is then leading to less projects able to pencil. And, you know, I wanted to get your perspective of like, you know, I know like manufacturing in the U.S. or... <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, know, I, know, I see what's going on here. <laughs> You're putting me on the spot. This was not talked about in the pre <laughs> No, We could always edit it out. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's a great question. Yeah, I mean, look, I don't claim to be an expert in solar modules, and maybe there are folks out there that will disagree. But ultimately, when I look at it, it seems to me like you can only get a module to be so efficient, right? There's only so much energy from the sun that hits the earth in a square meter. And then within that, you can only capture, I forget, what it is if it's under 30 percent i think right yes so even the higher wattage modules a lot of times they're just a little bigger and i don't know how to take more costs out of that i mean every gain of efficiency seems like it's trumped by either a tariff or an increase in aluminum cost which is the frame right Solar panels to me and the cost is already, I think they're pretty low. And speaking specifically to residential solar, I would say most of the cost at this point is the customer acquisition cost. And that's not only marketing and all these other things, but cancellations and what you have to pay if a customer cancels the job, but you already have permitting. And sometimes you can protect yourself against that. But a lot of these different things roll up into this cost to acquire a customer. And because we're not quite there yet, I mean, I see solar going up everywhere around me, which is really encouraging. But I still don't think people, there's not one spot where people go, wake up and say, I want solar. I'm going to go here and look for it. Usually it's somebody calling them or they see a Facebook thing, you know, or whatever, and they click the link. So I don't think it's quite that mainstream yet, at least maybe outside of Hawaii and California. And I believe whoever cracks that code in residential solar is ultimately going to be the winner. I know, you know, when Tesla bought Solar City, they kind of tried to do that, right? No sales reps, all virtual. I learned that we both had the same experience of ordering, but not <laughs> owning a Tesla. And maybe it's another story for another day. But when you do that, then they push solar and all these other things. Sure. I don't know how much they're really in the space anymore. We don't really run into them. But I think they're just like all things that Elon Musk does. They're just a little early, but they're the catalyst that the industry needs. So I applaud him for that. You know, I think his goal has always been to get everyone to convert to an electric vehicle and not necessarily a Tesla, just, I mean, electric vehicle in general. At one point, they released all the patents to all the vehicles. It's hard to take like a position on that. If we could build it less expensive in the U.S., then I think we should do it and you wouldn't need a tariff. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I agree with you as well. Or like free trade. I think a, another interesting point that you mentioned, I don't think that people realize is how expensive customer acquisition costs are. You know, I worked at Solar City, so I looked at a lot of the customer acquisition numbers. And what was interesting to see was like the differential between like a national residential solar company compared to like um, regional or local. Their cost of acquisition of customers was a lot lower. It's interesting because I think a lot of your partners, meaning residential and 
installers are really strong local presences that they're really building the relationship with the customer and then you're providing financing. But I wonder if you have any ideas of like how maybe customer acquisition costs could decrease over time. It's interesting because you kind of touched to that point by talking about different, you know, there's no one sort of place that people hear. They hear it through friends, you know, phone call, maybe an ad. A lot of referrals. Home Depot, referrals, yeah, exactly. you know, yeah, Lowe's or... I think you hit most of them. And just thinking about it for the first time, this is a knee-jerk reaction. And because I don't think there's that silver bullet yet where people are waking up and going to, you know, whatever, Tesla, I'll just pick on them because we're talking about it and like, oh, I want solar, I'm going to go to Tesla and sign up. Because that's not happening at scale, it will eventually, but not right now. So what could you do now to drive down the customer acquisition cost? The first thing that popped in my head, honestly, was reduce the time from sale to install to PTO. So permission to operate, that means turning your system on with the utility. And you can look across the board and something that California does pretty well. Like you can install a system and get everything operational and permitted, same day permits, less than a month. But then you come to some places in the Northeast and it could take 45 days once it's built just for the utility to come turn it on. And the permits could take weeks, right? And I know there's a lot of things out there I've been reading or just, I wouldn't say I'm involved in, just kind of I see on the periphery, I think SIA is doing some different initiatives, the Solar Energy Industry Association to shorten that permit to time or do like virtual permits for solar. I think that would be a big help because again, kind of hearkening back now, maybe I'm going to have to tell a story about like ordering the Tesla, right? It's the same concept. That excitement wears off really quick when you're six weeks in and you still don't have your car and you're like, Hmm, do I really want this car? Yeah. Like I do, it's cool, but like it's just not the same as literally anything else. I think one guy explained it to me once who's really high up in sales at a national company. You know, when you go to the store and you pick up that big screen TV, you know, everyone needs it now. You order it, you pick it up same day or you get same day delivery. And you're driving to home, there's like a split second. It's like, do I need a TV this big? You know, whatever. <laughs> you get it on the wall, it's like, oh man, this is awesome, right? And I think that's how customers feel about solar. And then two months later, when there's still no solar on their roof, for instance, I, I'm just picking a time. I mean, then that excitement wears off and they want to cancel. Sure. And sure, if it's a loan, you know, you might tell them, well, there's a permit fee or this or that or the other. But for a TPO product or third party owned product, I don't want to own it, even if I have sunk costs in the permits. If the customer wants to cancel and it's not built yet, it's a long term agreement. We're going to be married to each other for a while. I want them to be happy. I want them to be excited and pay their bill. Obviously, that's just a small piece of the puzzle. But when you ask the question, that's literally the first thing that popped in my head. I'm sure I'm going to be driving home later today. Like, oh, I can think of four other things I should have said that are probably more impactful. But just off the top of my head, that's what I would say is one thing that we could do better as, you know, states or however you want to, federal government, however you want to look at it to expedite that process and make it a little easier for not only the contractor, but the homeowner as well. This episode of the Solar Maverick Podcast is brought to you by Podcast Laundry, the podcast concierge service that I use to make sure that my listeners hear the best quality show. They do the dirty work of podcasting for me. Yes, graphics, quotes, show notes, master editing, and much more. All I have to do is record. So if you're a busy podcaster like me with an engaged audience and want to free up time to do more of what you'd love to do, like going to the gym or spending time with loved ones, go to podcastlaundry.com to schedule your consultation or call 347 877 8273. That's podcastlaundry.com or 347-871-8273. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. And I know I asked you this the last podcast as well, but what about people being comfortable buying solar online? Yeah, I think we'll get there, you know, and I probably have flip-flopped a couple times on this just in the last two years. I don't know when it became bad to change your mind, like (laughs) somewhere in society in America, just side tangent, it seems like people are scared to do these things because like, remember two years ago, you said that no one would buy solar online. Ha! I also said the ITC was going to get extended, which it did a year later for the record. So I was half right. But (laughs) yeah, I mean, it depends when you ask me, but I do think that's the end state, right? 
you get to the point where you don't have to be sold solar. Like you don't have to have a canvasser or somebody on the phone. It's like, hey, I'm buying a house. I want solar. I mean, California took it a step further, right? All new home starts need solar. I know just enough about that to get myself in trouble, but it seems to me you can meet the requirement with three panels. And at the end of the year, these customers are going to get hit with a massive utility bill because they're not offsetting as much power as they should be. I don't know how you get around that. I'm not close enough to it, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. And I think we talked about on the last one, you're asking me what I thought, I don't know the exact wording of it, but like the best subsidy would be, or maybe not even subsidy is the right word. Uh, everyone's probably tuning out That's, right now. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is interesting. But the question was like, how should the government incentivize, I guess, reductions of carbon emissions? Right. Yes. And it's different by state. That was my answer then. And I've put a lot of thought into this and it's like the least popular thing. And we talked about this too, because I asked you, I don't think it's ever been brought up on your show, which I find kind of odd because of the content, of, you know, of being a solar podcast. But the only thing that makes sense to me, and I've heard arguments for and against it, is a carbon tax. Because... I try and always think as logically as possible and lean on common sense economics. And I believe that most people listening would agree that there are negative externalities in burning fossil fuels that are not currently attributed to the price. Meaning there's a negative effect in the environment. Even if you don't think it's warming, let's, yes, or stream weather, go to LA, right? It's air quality. It's all these other things that have a negative effect on your health. If you live there, right? And then you pay for that through healthcare or have a negative effect if you are on this side of the camp with me that it's causing stream weather events like in Texas, you know, where they got snow, which is crazy and power outages. And that costs not only Texans, but the economy, I'm just going to throw it out, has to be in the billions of dollars. All those refineries and other things that had to close because of the extreme cold. So there are consequences to carbon that no one's paying for, very real third-party consequences. And I think we need to price that in and then the market will correct itself. Companies that go carbon neutral, you know, they're not going to pay that tax and it will ultimately drive the behavior you want. So as I've been thinking about this since you asked, because it was a good question, I think I would change my answer. And I don't know, I had like a very specific one last time, but it's not about how do you get higher adoption of renewables through a subsidy, but rather just appropriately pricing carbon. I like even hesitate to call it a tax. But just taking into account the other costs of burning fossil fuels, which, again, by the way, is a limited resource, right? You saw, I don't know, I was going to joke about this, but right now there's, you know, you get in the car and first thing on the news everyone's talking about is the lines at the gas station because of this recent hack on the pipeline or whatever. And I just like to think that, you know, maybe in that instance, if I had my Tesla, I would be very excited. <laughs> <laughs> but, Me too. <laughs> So that's what I think the ultimate solution is. I don't have any confidence we'll ever actually get there. It just seems like something that's not very popular. And again, I'm not, it's not like I'm on the Hill, like advocating for it. So I'm not even close to it, but I don't think the Biden administration has talked about it at all, to my knowledge. But they're doing a lot of other good things. You know, there's a lot of things on the table, another extension of ITC possibly, or, you know, this infrastructure bill. I think decoupling batteries from having their own ITC or federal investment tax credit. So just money you get back from the government to offset taxes for putting up solar or battery, I think will provide opportunities. I know um, we talk about distributed generation. One of the things we've talked about every episode I've been on is batteries. And there's been a million places to kind of shoehorn that in that I didn't. So we might as well just go right into <laughs> what are you seeing with batteries and what do you think the future is? I mean, I think the future is pretty bright with batteries. I think we're still waiting for the cost to be economical to see like a large adoption and as well as states having incentives. There are certain states in the Northeast that have it. I think batteries are going to be a huge part of what's going to be going forward, whether it be, you know, batteries coupled with solar on residential, commercial, industrial, as well as obviously electric vehicles, constant the electrification of the grid. So, and then I think lithium ion is the popular technology now, but I think there'll be other technologies in the future that are probably going to be more popular that maybe we might not necessarily know. I know like, you know, obviously with lithium ion, there's more like fire issues as well, which we've seen with some of the Tesla cars, but I think it's going to change everything. And it's just going to see the same price drops that we saw in solar panels. 
a few years ago, you know, kind of translate with batteries. So I think it's a pretty exciting time. I think the thing is like the complexity related to the batteries. There's so many different uses of the battery and the software too is another key, like having a great software solution. What are your thoughts like on batteries? Is that something that IGS is looking into? Would you recommend them to couple storage with batteries at this point? It's actually funny, especially with Texas, what's going on there. It's even hard to find batteries right now. It's just literally <laughs> exploded, no pun intended, but people are flocking to batteries to protect themselves from these type of outages. I agree. I think it depends on what you're trying to do. So IGS has been toying with batteries for, I think, four plus years. We put some in our basement, some residential and very small commercial batteries to test them. And the market's even changed so much since then. We were looking at more technical I want to get into, but aggregating these batteries as like a virtual power plant, which I, I think eventually what a lot- Oh, you said that. I actually talked about this on the podcast. Yeah. The last one, two podcasts ago. I think that's ultimately the end game. Scale is yeah. going to win. That has not changed from last time we had this conversation. But where I've been struggling as a TPO provider, a third-party owner, is how do you add value to the customer? So we were talking about this yesterday, actually, which made me do a little bit of light Googling yesterday just to confirm some of my suspicions. But when you look at the amount of power outages throughout the country, it's really quite small in aggregate. And sure, like when you look at the top three, like California, Texas, and New York, high population densities, they might experience more outages than others. And depending on where your power source is from, and is it, you know, utility or municipal or... But ultimately, from what I could find from the energy industry was that average interruptions for a normal, you know, on average is like 1.3 a year for four hours total. The reason why I bring this up, you think of a cost of a battery and say it's $10,000 for a 10 kilowatt hour battery. And it depends on a whole host of things. Are you adding it on or is it going to be part of storage? Are you taking ITC on it? The cost is sort of irrelevant. It could be twice that. It could be a little less that. Let's just pick a round number. But you're going to pay $10,000 if you're doing a loan or cash for a battery to offset four hours for a normal customer of disruption a year. To me, Maybe I'm cheap. My wife probably said I'm cheap. <laughs> that doesn't seem like a good economical solution. But what you said, that's where it gets interesting. If I'm a TPO provider, I can add the battery. Maybe you pay a little bit for backup power per month, but I have other ways to monetize the battery into the grid, or I can aggregate thousands of them and do demand response or frequency regulation or a whole host of other. In other words, when the grid needs power, like it's 105 degrees out and the grid's like a good analogy would be. I think everyone's seen Christmas Vacation when yeah. he turns the lights on when they finally sure. work and they show the power plant and they have to hit the auxiliary power. Yes. So if you could get all the bad, that's demand response, That's right? demand response, yes. <laughs> yeah, so that's a good analogy. That is a good analogy. Uh, so you basically would turn all your batteries on to give the grid power to compensate because by the time you fire up a peaker plan or something like that, you know, you, the spike might be gone. So there's all these ways to play in batteries. And candidly, we're still sorting through it. We're looking to do some customer sighted pilots this year. I think it makes a lot of sense for the customer economically in California because they have time of use rates. You know, I think most people in the Northeast, the way I always describe it, maybe this is a bad analogy. It's like, you know, why does your dishwasher have a nighttime button like that run at night? <laughs> well, you know, people here, if you're not on time of use, it's sort of irrelevant unless you don't want to hear it. But if you're in Texas or California and you can have way less expensive power at night, then it makes a whole lot of sense to have that feature. So because of that, you know, you can use a battery to collect solar at its peak and then deploy it in the evening when power is more expensive. So now you're offsetting more expensive power. So that battery is going to start to pay for itself pretty quickly. Still get a little bit of that resiliency. Again, you're controlling your energy future. And then there's states like Mass that have a lot of different programs for demand response that literal customers can participate in at the residential level. And they aggregate them up, just like I was talking about. And I think there's a lot of value there. So it'll get close. I don't know how far batteries have to fall where it makes economic sense for everyone. But there are people, I mean, what I'm hearing in the industry, like Florida, even Pennsylvania, Ohio, people are starting more and more the battery attachment rate or the amount of customers that want a battery with their solar is getting higher and higher and higher. And, you know, for me personally, just I guess everyone's life's formed through experience and we just rarely have power outages. Like I couldn't imagine 
I will say, I'm sure there's times and I've experienced them in my life for sure, where if you have a basement and you lose power for the day and it's just pouring down rain, it would be really nice to have your sump pump still running. So there's definitely advantages to it, but what are you willing to pay? Is that $100 a month for four hours a year? Is it 50? I don't know. I think that has yet to be determined, but I do know that customers are demanding and wanting access to that resiliency and they're watching the news and seeing what happened in Texas and people sleeping in their Tesla, which is interesting. And I will say too, I've been thinking about this and what is the value prop. And it's my understanding that if you connect the Tesla to your house and your power's out, that you'll avoid the warranty. That's my understanding. And you could damage it. So it's pretty inexpensive to do. I think you just need to buy a little inverter and you can run it. Again, you got to remember, you're not going to run your whole house. You can only draw so much power. You could do some critical loads, a few light appliances, a sump pump, a refrigerator, maybe things like that, some lights and outlet. But even that, if you had a full battery system, it's only going to last a day, half a day. I mean, depending on how much energy you're using, if it's 10 kilowatt hours, say as an average battery size, I'm picking a number, I would guess that's what we're looking at. I would guess somewhere in that ballpark than what it's thousand thousand watts for hours so you could run 10 hours mm -hmm. effectively. Again, depending on what critical loads you want to run, it's not going to run everything. But then I look at, I think two days ago, and maybe it was longer than that as I saw it two days ago, Ford announced their new F-150 Lightning is what they're calling it, the electric yeah. truck. That will run your house. To me, that's economical. So <laughs> I can get a badass electric, oh, we said I'm not allowed to swear. Oh, it's okay. You can get we won't edit it. You can get, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That oh, was so good. <laughs> but you can get a really cool electric truck. You know, it's going to go way faster, I'm sure, than the gasoline version of F-150. And instead of having a battery pack, you can just plug that thing in and run your critical load. To me, that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. I think that's neat. And the cost of the battery is literally rolled in the truck. You're going to save money for, obviously, it's cheaper per mile on electric, especially if you have solar. Mm -hmm. So all this is kind of coming together, right? And then that, your truck now, instead of buying a ten, twenty thousand $20,000 battery, it's all right yeah. in your truck. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. I mean, think about it, like how many people would buy like an electric vehicle just because of that. And then it's going to just increase over time, like the whole electrification of the fleet. And then it's naturally going to lead people to buy solar as well. If they even just bought the truck, it just doesn't make sense not to have solar on your roof. As no, well, I agree. You know? So it just expands the process. And it's pretty exciting to see like all the major power manufacturers getting into electric vehicles. It's just surprising to see like how many commercials you're seeing on TV about electric vehicles and outside of the Tesla, you know. I think it was two Super Bowls ago. That's all there was. I swear, <laughs> yeah. every commercial. I remember writing a, a little LinkedIn article about that. I just couldn't believe how many commercials. I think, was it Washington State is already committed to like 100% electric by 2030? I might be wrong on that. Oh, wow. I read I something like this. They were the first state, super yeah. aggressive. And you're right. These kind of steps in pushing toward sustainable energy, it's all kind of circular. It's self-fulfilling. Almost anyone who asks me about solar, I feel like is because they're buying a Tesla or an electric car. Yeah, for sure. My neighbor stopped me like, <laughs> hey, you know, you have solar. I want to buy a Tesla. You know, they ask about, you know, what's the advantage? Like, I'm going to be using all this power now because it can really increase your consumption. It's still more effective or more efficient, cost effective per mile than gas, obviously. I think that's where this is going. But again, just to have the backup power just in your truck in your driveway. That's really neat. <laughs> I think that's cool. I think there's other manufacturers that might do something similar. I'm sure, you know, you know, Tesla is obviously the innovator here, so I'm sure they'll catch up or whatever. They'll pivot to make sure that their cars have that capability. And maybe they do now. At last I saw that it voided the warranty, I believe. Uh, I think it's interesting because like, obviously you would then have to probably replace the battery more frequently based on how much you're using that power from the truck or car. So I would think these manufacturers would want to do that because then there's like extra work that they would have to do. You know, you have to go to a Tesla trained yeah. technician or, you know, people are basically going to the Tesla to replace the batteries. So that's interesting that it's potentially not like in their business model as well, but I'm sure like they'll adapt. I often wondered what that entailed. Like if you have a Tesla for so long yeah. and then you need to change, like how does that happen? Like what does that look like? Yeah, I have no idea. Then think about it as well. Like you're disposing the old batteries. Like how does that work? They're hard to recycle. That is one yeah. of the problems. I mean, look, nothing's perfect and you're going to have people, well, what are you going to do with all these solar panels and we're not recycling them yet. I get that question, like not all the time, but sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it's usually from people within the industry, actually. Oh, yeah. It's not necessarily someone throwing stones, but I think other people ask them. Them. 
there's a lot of metal in there that you can certainly recycle. Most of it's glass and aluminum. But they're like, well, why aren't more people doing this? Because they're going to last for 35 years and there's not many solar panels that are 35 years old. A lot of the ones that are, you know, something happens, they're in a weather disaster or something, mm -hmm. you know, tornado hits it. They salvage the panels they can and they redeploy them somewhere else. Not in a new install, obviously, but like <laughs> yeah. maybe a nonprofit or some agency or somewhere overseas where they don't have power. The fact is they're going to last a long time. Oh, and by the way, then they're still going to be what? 80%. It's not like they just yeah. die. People have this idea in their head that, <laughs> oh, they last 35 years and then you got to trash it. Well, no, in 35 years, they're going to be producing 80% of what they used to. Yeah. Once they're on your roof, it's probably going to be the cheapest form of power ever. It's not going to make sense to take it down, even if there is some new innovative technology sure. out there. And like we talked about, panels can only get so efficient. Like physically, meaning physics, it's only, like I said, so yeah. much energy hits the earth and only so much of that can be converted through photovoltaics to energy. And panels are pretty good right now. So I don't know how much more efficiency you can drive out of them. It's still 80% of the panel that you could use. Basically, the degradation is like, what, 0.05% yeah. per year. It's degradating. So, yeah, that makes sense that it would be 80% of the panel. I think it is 80, yeah. but I'm not exactly sure. It's but still that you could use it. Like, after 35 years, it doesn't 100%. mean like it's still, and it's already paid for, I'm sure. It would be great for you to talk about like the Monday motivation. I know we spoke about in the last podcast, since the last podcast, now you're doing like a video format. It would be great for you to talk about that. I think, you know, our listeners would be pretty interested in hearing about it. Hey, I think the comment, the suggestion was from you to do the video. I, yeah, it was from me. I know we talked about how it got started on one of the other podcasts, so you can go back and listen to that. But basically, I have a whiteboard in my office, and this was actually pre-COVID. I was doing a lot of Zoom calls with work, and I work remotely. So a lot of our meetings I would just do with this video call, and I really liked it, but I noticed that people could read this whiteboard. So I took advantage and started writing funny stuff on it, kind of like in some of the Shows on ESPN. <laughs> yeah, <they> have. <laughs> so that was kind of the concept. And then I started writing motivational quotes instead. I don't even know how it started. Then I started posting it and it kind of just grew and it was interesting. And it's one of those things, you know, I just kind of did it. I didn't have a motive or I just, well, I wanted to inspire people, I guess, in yeah. some way, or maybe someone could relate. So I started from there, started putting a story to it. And you would ask me, why don't I just do a bunch of them and kind of stack them and then just release yeah. them weekly? It's because I literally try and relate every quote quote that week to something that's happened in my life. You know, my mom's birthday, kid's first day of school, wife's anniversary, whatever it is. It could be a conversation I had with my son or having to ask what an acronym was in a meeting and feeling foolish for a second, but realizing <laughs> it's better to ask than not ask, yeah. right? And there's all these quotes that I have in my book that's right in front of me, actually, that are associated with these things. So I, if I see a good quote somewhere, I write it down. And then every week, I you know associate that quote to something that's going on. And you had suggested... Felt like it was getting traction and people, again, they seem to bring it up often. So I feel like people are out there getting some value out of it. So I started uh, doing a video, which is a little bit of a learning curve, but iMac makes it pretty easy. And we talked about that. I just bought lights. So, cause I, I wear a hat a lot. I don't know why I just, I guess it's my thing, you know, put shadows. It's like, I got to work on the sound, but I kind of like that it's raw and it's personal. I think that makes it a little bit more interesting. Like I don't think about what I'm going to wear that day for the video or did I wear this shirt last video. As I said, anyone notices that is watching way too closely. And if they want to be my editor, they certainly can. <laughs> But yeah, so I started, instead of just writing about it, doing these video formats, they're generally a minute and 30 seconds. If you want to follow me on LinkedIn, check it out. But every Monday at some point in the day, I put one of these out that just has a quote. This one revolved around Mother's Day, and it was from the novelist who published The Color Purple. Her name's Alice Walker. And she said, my mother handed down respect for the possibilities and the will to grasp them. And this really resonated with me because anyone who's heard me talk about my family and my mom is something I think they've instilled is not being limited by your mind. In fact, spoiler, I don't know if this will be out before my next one, but it's probably going to stay along these same lines of limiting beliefs. And we we're talking about Les Brown. I like a lot of Les Brown quotes. He really got me into just wanting to be a motivator more than anything and just motivate one person or two people who motivate two people. And that whole concept is awesome. And so when people tell me, hey, I saw your video, I really liked her, I found it inspirational. That's more than enough to keep doing it. Just one person 
in. But anyway, Les Brown said, life has no limitations except the ones you make. And I love this concept of limiting beliefs. And I know also you like Tony Robbins, like yes, I do. Sure. I've never seen him or I wouldn't say I'm like that hardcore, but read his book and I follow him and I like a lot of the stuff he does, but he has a great anecdote about a metaphor of going to the circus. Have you ever heard this one? I haven't, no. He talks about, he does it in an excellent way. I'm not going to do it justice, but he talks about going to the circus for the first time and he looks at this elephant and the elephant's standing there and it's got this little rope around its neck. And you know, you're looking at it, you know the elephant could rip down the entire tent if he wanted to, right? But the elephant's just staying put with that rope that's tied to a stake in the ground. And that's because they trained that elephant from when it was small. And when it was small, they put this huge stake in the ground, they threw the rope around its neck, and the elephant fought and fought and fought, and he couldn't break free of the rope. He couldn't pull the stake out of the ground. And at some point along the line, that became the elephant's belief. When it's a small elephant, he believed that no matter what I do, I can't get away from this rope. And he took that belief until he was a big elephant and now he doesn't even try anymore. So if you think about it and what he says is, so this is not my original thought, but I just think it's really interesting because it's true. If, when did you set limitations in your life? When was it that you decided you couldn't do something? And if you really examine that and get rid of those limiting thoughts, I think you'll find you can accomplish a lot more than you ever thought possible. Yeah, that's a really interesting quote. I mean, I think we all have our things that are holding us back. And really, if we believed more about our own expectations or what we could do, everyone's life would be a lot different. So that's interesting. Totally agree. I think, again, as Les Brown said, life has no limitations except the ones you make. That's true. It's all in our mind. Well, this has been an amazing episode of the Solar Maverick podcast, the 100th episode. I really appreciate, Nate, you making the time out of your schedule to meet in person to talk about what you're working on. If people wanted to learn more about you, like what's the best ways for them to Definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm always looking to connect there, especially other positive professional people that want to connect. Just I love watching people's feeds compared to any other social media I don't really use. I dabble on Instagram, but that's a great way to connect. Otherwise, I'm sure my contact information will be in the details of this episode. If you're a residential installer and you want a TPO product, certainly <laughs> reach out. Uh, I'd love to talk to you. And as always, Benoit, it's been a blast, a true pleasure. And we didn't do it this time because it's the middle of the day, although I did get you to come out and do it in person <laughs> next time the 150th or whatever the next milestone <laughs> yeah. is we're doing it like after dinner glass of whiskey joe rogan style <laughs> that was gonna be the first people on the podcast to do that long form for sure <laughs> i don't know if i could go for two hours three hours sure you can. Joking. i'm sure i could <laughs> especially as we drink more whiskey <laughs> exactly. you know, as it goes by it seems like that never bothered elon he would just keep drinking more exactly. whiskey and other stuff, depending on the interview. So definitely that sounds good about the whiskey for the next 150th episode. And thank you to our audience. I mean, without you, we wouldn't be here. So I really appreciate that. And thank you again, Nate. We'll talk soon. Awesome. Thanks, Benoit. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Solar Maverick Podcast. The Solar Maverick Podcast is brought to you by Renew Energy. We're a solar development and consulting firm. If you believe that this podcast is adding value to you, please give us a five-star review and share with those that you think could benefit from this information. Please email all questions, suggestions, and feedback to info at renewenergy.com. That's I-N-F-O at R-E-N-E-U energy.com. The Solar Maverick Podcast is produced by Podcast Laundry and executive produced by Benoit Thangin and Kevin Y. Brown. 